you know, an addiction in itself can be consuming, right, in nature, right? Because it, an addiction sometimes doesn't allow people to function when, when responsibilities come up, when, when um, people are depending on them. Um, that could be, you know, sexual addictions or um, drug addictions or, you know, maybe, maybe there's even more like emotional addictions. Like people are so emotionally, emotionally addicted to, to being angry or being sad. They, they want to feel sad or they want to feel bad because it almost helps them identify with themselves. It's like their comfort zone. Maybe if you can explain a little bit more in, like what psychology says about addictions, like what the definition is, and then we can start applying it to see how it affects social interactions. Yeah, so addictions in psychology are, they're now called a, a substance use disorder in the DSM-5. Uh, so they're a mental disorder that can be di diagnosed if certain criteria are met. There's a, so there's substance use disorder, which is what we normally think of as an addiction. Then there's a, like intoxication that can be diagnosed, like substance intoxication for all the different substances. And there's certain symptoms that you look for for that as well. Now, substance use disorder requires certain criteria. The most important ones that stand out are increasing tolerance to the drug or substance. So like they need more of the substance in order to keep having the same high, the same effect. Mm -hmm. And then like the cravings for it, like they want to use the substance again when they stop. And then withdrawal symptoms, whenever they stop using, they start experiencing certain physical and psychological like negative effects. So those are substance use addictions, right? To like drugs, alcohol, all that different stuff. But then there's also something called uh, behavioral addictions, which is also called mm. process, process addictions. And those addictions are still being researched. There's only a few of them that have made it into the DSM-5 for diagnosing mental disorders, like gambling use disorder or gambling disorder or gambling. Yeah, I think it's gambling disorder um, to where someone feels the need to keep gambling or else they have, you know, certain withdrawal or cravings and, and certain things like that to keep gambling. I think they were working on trying to get other addictions in the DSM. So like uh, internet use addiction. Wow. Yeah. Pornography addiction, sex addiction, gaming addiction, like video game addiction. They still haven't really made it to be like where they can be diagnosed. And the most controversial one is actually a, a, a sex addiction because, you know, most mm. it's hard to like, there's such a huge gray area because, you know, most human beings crave and want sex at some point in their it's, life. It's like I mean, inherent, right? It's like like a natural desire, right? So it's like, how do you turn that into a mental disorder? Where's the where do you draw the line? People are still debating heavily on that. So most people who have an addiction to some degree know that it's bad, but they still continue to do it because it's it's already ingrained in their habitual behaviors, right? And so it's become ingrained to the point where they self-identify with that type of behavior. Um, almost to say, as somebody identifies with, you know, being a school teacher or, or their profession, the body chemically, um, I guess, accepted it as well, right? Because there's, like you said, chemical uh, interactions that happen in the brain that solidify and create, you know, neural pathways that yeah. confirm your identity as a self, like a sex addict or, or a drug addict. I'm surprised, you know, like some people can just like uh, cold turkey, just stop doing yeah. what, 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 what used to be an addiction unless it wasn't an addiction, right? But how do you think that it affects social interactions? There's different stages. So if you were to look at when the, the addiction has already started and the addiction has been going on for quite some time, then that's actually one of the criteria for substance use disorder. So the use of the substance, creating social problems, problems in life, like problems at work, like being late to work, mm -hmm. uh, use during the day, use in the like alcohol use, for example, uh, using alcohol in the morning, you see that's a sign that an addiction could be starting. Not in every single case, but in a fair amount. And of course, there's other factors that play into it. And then there's also like risky use. Is that person taking substantial legal risks to get the substance? And is it interfering with their life as a result? Are they putting their lives in danger, other people's lives in danger because of the substance? That's when they're putting the substance above not only their life, but other people's lives. And that's when you know it's so severe that 
they can only think of using the substance. And that's when you more likely to classify it as a substance use disorder. Maybe they're hiding their use of the drug and that's affecting relationships with their wife or children. You know, yeah. it creates conflict. It just does. And, or they're not spending as much time with their family because they're spending more time using the substance or chasing the substance. Or another common thing is they're trying to find money to sustain the, the getting the substance to keep using the substance. So they're trying to borrow money from family or friends all the time to, and then also like we talked about in a prior podcast, cues, uh, cues for use of the substance. So if they go hanging with the same people, friends they're hanging with when they're mm-hmm. using the drug, then they're more likely to relapse because those it reactivates. Things. There's certain things that kind of get so ingrained in your memory that, that it's almost like slightly there. And it's just, waiting for you to hit the that that string for for it to come back and like sure. get the memory going on again and i was reading a book about uh stopping sexual like uh addictions and stuff like that like they they did scans on people's brains and it literally created new narrow pathways oh yeah I'm of sure. like of so so that it's almost like if we think about it as cities it created a new road that was more efficient so yeah that way you don't have to use this longer road because this longer road wastes time for family and for important things and it's just like a narrow road that whenever you need to use it you use it maybe people's gps get lost and they they turn into that road right that that used to be paved there it's not as efficient as the other one but i think as as we as we strengthen and widen the new narrow pathways i think that there's less likelihood of going there because one it's not logical anymore because now we have this bigger road to get faster to to and do things going off the road analogy when a neural pathway a new road is formed in the brain with the after using that substance over and over for long periods of several weeks and months and then years that road gets stronger and stronger each time the person uses a substance and so when they Mm -hmm. try to stop using it and then let's say years pass and they they haven't used a substance in years, that road is still there. And, and because the road is there, when it wasn't there before they use a substance, it's far easier to fall back on that road than it was before the road was built. Just to give an example of how physical it is in our brain, when we use a drug, tolerance builds up. What is tolerance, really? What is it actually? So we use the substance, it binds to certain neuron receptors in our brain, which we can think of as keyholes, you know, like you have a keyhole in each You have unique keys that only work in certain holes. And the same thing with certain medications and drugs and substances, only certain uh, chemicals bind to certain neuron receptors in our brain. When they get transferred through that synaptic gap between our neurons, after a long period of time of doing that drug over and over and over again, and binding to the receptors over and over and over again in the synaptic gap, the neurons change. The, 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 amount, the number of keyholes for the drug, the number of re- neuron receptors actually decrease because mm. you don't need as much because the brain learns. You, it's being bombarded with the substance all the time in the neuron receptors. So it's like, well, I don't need as many neuron receptors as I did before because I have plenty of this chemical coming in, plenty of this drug. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reduce the five neuron receptors down to just two right? Mm. And so then the person needs more of the substance to bind to those neuron receptors to have that effect that they had when they had five neuron receptors. And so there is a really physical change in those neurons when you use a drug for a long time. And that's why tolerance builds up because you need more because there's only two now. And then when you stop using the drug, of course, now it's like, oh, I need more of the substance. You know, it's the brain's freaking out. And then after a while, the neuron receptors will start coming back and then you'll have five receptors again. Because it's like I need more uh, fishing poles to catch the fish, I guess, as an analogy.